पेज थर्टी नाइन One who sees the infallible cause and effect of all phenomena in circular existence and beyond, and destroys all perceptions of inherent existence, has entered the path pleasing the Buddha. One who sees the infallible cause and effect and destroys all perceptions of inherent existence has entered the path which sees, pleases the Buddha. So that means I explained to you about interdependent origination, emptiness, as two sides of the same coin, right? So therefore, through such practice and study, when one sees the infallible cause and effect, that means if you accumulate certain cause, the effect will be there. The fruit will be there. Infallible, incontrovertible also we call it. If you, for example, plant a rice seed, from there rice will grow, not banana. <laughs> right? So when you see this infallible cause and effect, cause and effect relation is so strong that there is no cheating. Right? When you see that there is this unchangeable connection between the cause and the effect, <coughs> and that type of <coughs> cause and effect continues not only in the samsara, but also in the nirvana. That means if you want to get liberated, the cause is the path of compassion, love, etc. that you cultivate. So one who sees the infallible cause and effect of all phenomena in cycle existence, where when you are in the samsara, and beyond means nirvana. Okay? And it is because of this understanding of interdependent reality, the cause-effect relationship, that this understanding destroys all perceptions of inherent existence. Right? Because as I said this too, as I already mentioned to one of the caution, there's no middle way. <laughs> right? There's no middle way between dependent origination and interdependent origination. When you see the interdependent origination, the cause-effect relationship, then your earlier focus and perception of seeing things as having inherent existence, that is destroyed. And when you do that, then you are on the right track, the path that pleases the Buddha, right? The path that pleases the Buddha, that's the meaning. Okay? And then, next verse, verse 43. Appearances are infallible dependent arisings, 
Emptiness is free of assertions. As long as these two understandings are seen as separate, one has not yet realized the intent of the Buddha. That means on the one hand, when you develop this understanding that the interdependent origination is infallible, non-deceiving, there is this very faithful connection on the level of appearance, right? When you understand that, meaning that on the level of the conventional truth, things that appears to you does not come from without causes or from in concordant causes. Whether it's conditioned phenomena, unconditioned phenomena, they all come in relation to the basis of designation or the thought that gives the designation. So therefore they are uh, interdependent, interrelated. So that is the meaning of interdependent origination in terms of designation. In the case of conditioned phenomena, they are dependent origination only in terms of they are being dependent on the cause and condition. But when you talk about both the permanent, impermanent or conditioned or unconditioned phenomena, they are all dependent primarily because they are all designated by a thought. Names are given by thoughts. So, so this understanding of dependent origination in terms of causific relationship, in terms of designation. Now when you relate this understanding with the mind that analyzes the ultimate truth, the mind that analyzes the ultimate truth will not find anything that has independent existence. Okay? So, that's the meaning. Emptiness free of assertion. Emptiness free of assertion means when a mind that analyzes emptiness or ultimate truth, that mind will, that will mind will find emptiness, of course. But that mind will now not assert anything having independent existence. Emptiness free of asserting that it has independent existence. Right? So you will, in other words, to simplify it, when you see dependent origination, then you will not propound inherent existence. There's no room for independent existence in the realm of ultimate truth or emptiness. So, as long as these two understandings are seen as separate, there's no cor correlation. If you think like that, then one has not yet realized the intent of the Buddha. So this is basically saying what I already has explained. We talk about things having no inherent independent existence or emptiness because because they are dependent on others. They are interrelated, interconnected. So it's because of this interconnectedness, there is a nothing, or things are empty of independent existence. So therefore you cannot assert things have independent existence. That's the meaning, okay? Then next verse on the same page. At the time when these two realizations are simultaneous and don't have to alternate, from the mere sight of infallible dependent arising comes ascertainment, which completely destroys all modes of grasping. At that time, the analysis of the profound view is complete. So that means at, the, at that time, as we read in the you know, previous verse, at that time when these two realizations, the realizations of dependent arising, and then the realization of emptiness, which is free from 
asserting things having independent existence, when these two realizations are simultaneous, because they support each other, right? Support each other. As soon as you see things have no independent existence, immediately you will know emptiness, right? When these two realizations are simultaneous and don't have to alternate, you know, immediately you will understand the other. From the mere sight, mere sight of infallible dependent arising, from, the, from just seeing that things are dependent originated, then comes the conviction, ascertainment, that there is no independent inherent existence, or in other words, there comes the ascertainment of emptiness, and that understanding then completely destroys all modes of grasping, here primarily means all modes of misconception, seeing things as having inherent existence will be destroyed. And when you do that, at that time the analysis of the profound view is complete. At that time, then your investigation, analysis of that is complete. Now you have perfectly understood. Right? So, so as I said earlier, the inter interdependent origination, emptiness, they are two sides of the same coin. When you understand interdependent origination, then naturally you will understand that things have no independent existence, which is emptiness, empty of independent existence. So they support each other. This is important because sometimes, you know, when things appear to you, then you, because of appearance of things, you tend to see them as having inherent independent existence. You fall into the extreme of permanence, when you talk about emptiness, you might end up, things have no, no, no existence at all. You fall into nihilism, right? So this understanding will lead you to the, on the middle path. You will not fall either into extreme of permanence or into extreme of uh, nihilism. Then next verse. Also, the extreme of existence is eliminated by the appearances and the extreme of non-existence is eliminated by, by the emptiness and if the mode of arising of cause and effect from emptiness is known, you will not be captivated by the view that grasps at extremes. Now that means Normally, normally it reads like this. Normally, normally it should be like this. Also, the extreme of existence is eliminated by normally the extreme of existence is eliminated by the not appearance. Extreme of extreme of existence. Ex extreme of and now this is like this. For example, this is this is talking about the very special understanding of the middle way, the Madhimika. That is eliminating the extreme of existence by appearance and removing the extreme of nihilism by emptiness. This is a very sp special instruction given by Manjushri. So Tsongkhapa is also teaching in a similar fashion. So that means, appearances means when you accept interdependent origination, right? Normally, when you when you when you accept existence or appearances through interdependent origination, you remove not extreme of existence. You remove extreme of non-existence. So that's why I was saying this is a unique way of teaching, right? For example, normally we say this is 
things are appearing, things are there. So you cannot say things are not there. The extreme of nihilism is removed. But he's teaching in the other way. Here he's saying that because things appear in the form of interdependent origination, therefore the extreme of existence means not just existent, extreme of inherent existence is eliminated. Now, when you develop the realization of shunyata or emptiness, then normally it removes the extreme of existence again. But here it says it removes the extreme of non-existence. That means when you realize the emptiness directly, then it means there is something existing. So not nihilism, there is something, right? So now the main point, let us not make it confusing. Make a, make, make a distinction, what, what we need to do is just this one. Make a distinction between existence and independent existence. Make a distinction between existence and independent existence. Is there existence? Is there independent existence? That's it. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Similarly, inherent existence is not there. True. But things exist. So therefore, now things exist. Therefore, things exist independently if you say, if you assert, because things exist, therefore things should exist independently, that is falling into the extreme of permanence. If you say things don't exist inherently, therefore things don't exist at all, that is falling into the extreme of nihilism. Right? So therefore now you follow the middle way, things exist but don't exist independently. That's what he's saying. Yes. Okay. Then the last line, probably the last one. Yeah, page 46. Finally, the concluding verse says, Thus, when you have realized the essentials of the three principal aspects of the path accordingly, seek solitude and generate the power of effort and quickly actualize your ultimate purpose, my son. So in this way, when you have realized the essentials, the, the essential meaning of the renunciation, bodhicitta, and emptiness, then you should spend time, meditate, seek solitude. Because if you remain with a big crowd, you, you can difficult, you, it's very difficult for you to concentrate. Because the noise and sound, they are like thorn to the mind of somebody who wants to achieve concentration. So solitude means not necessarily, not necessarily going into the mountain, things like that. But in the West also, I mean people normally, they, <laughs> whether they are practicing <laughs> huh? privacy or practicing Dharma, I don't know, but you, you, be, be, if you just, just stay in your room, it's not noisy normally. I know one Geshe from Sarah Monastery, very elderly Geshe, he's teaching in uh, Australia. So he said he, in Australia he's able to do his Dharma practice very well, because he said, uh, I go to the class to teach and after that I just go back to my room and hardly anybody comes. So normally it is you who are visiting every place, going, then, then, you, right, 
if you stay alone, nobody, I mean, in my case also, I stay alone, and hardly anybody comes. <laughs> Very quiet. <laughs> right? So you have to find that solitude, not just in a mountain, but anywhere, find solitude. And then, you know, uh, as I said earlier, spend some time every day, at least sometime in the morning, sometime in the evening, or whatever, whenever, whenever it is appropriate. Spirit, spend some time for your reflection, for practice, for study, for thinking. That is like charging the battery. And then when you mix with the people and meet strange people, get problems, then you can use that charged battery and show the light. That's the way, right? Then you might get a problem, then I can go back and think, you know, so like that. Seek solitude and generate the power of effort, that's the thing. Generate the power of effort. You, you need to strive, you need to make effort. If you don't make any effort, it will not come. As I said, there is no push button enlightenment. Even if you meet the greatest teacher, he might be able to tell you some very, you know, essential so-called pit instructions. He might be able to give you, but still you have to practice. Right? There was uh, one uh, attendant to the Buddha, a bhikshu actually, Gelung Lekbe Karma. He served the Buddha for many years and he, he said, I served you for 25 years, I did not see even one particle of quality in you. <laughs> I didn't, did not see anything good in you. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? So, so unless you have this receptivity, you will not be able to appreciate good things in other people and good things in your teacher also, right? So it's important to develop this um, sensitivity, receptivity, capacity to appreciate good things. There are so many good things, not only in, in uh, some great teachers, but in even ordinary people. You know, some of the ordinary, seemingly ordinary people, they have, by nature, they have many good qualities, some of them, better than some of the so-called great teachers. See, so only you only have to have that eye to see and appreciate those qualities, <laughs> right? So solitude and generate the power of effort. So so he's saying, don't be lazy. Counter force against effort is laziness. Laziness is of many types. One laziness is laziness, as we normally understand, which is not just not doing anything and sitting. That's one laziness, right? So don't do that. Second thing is laziness means procrastination. I have to do this, yes, I will do. But next time, after I finish my job, after my child goes to the school or whatever, you know, pro procrastination. Or I'll do dharma practice, but after watching this latest movie, <laughs> things like that. So you procrastinate, postpone your practice. That is also laziness. Another laziness is attachment to inferior things. You do the less important inferior things first, and the most important things last because it is easier for you to do, or there are many people who are supporting you in doing those bad things, not so good things. And when you do the do dharma practice, not many people support you. So therefore it is said, many of these teachings, you should not declare to those people who have no, who are not ready. Otherwise they might think, yeah, God, right? that's wasting time. So when you meet such people, don't get discouraged. Take time and then, you know, if they're interested, explain. If they're not interested, don't talk about it. Do your practice. Right? 
right? I, I remember one person who was, who later on became a monk. And uh, his parents didn't like that. Westerners, he didn't like that. So they were not on talking terms. But he did very well. He, he spent many years in Dharamsala, studied in the same school where I studied, many years he studied. And gradually he started to make some collection, you know. Then they, the parents were very happy. They came to Dharamsala to see him, you know, things like that. So it, take, it takes time. And then I also remember another person who said, my, my, this, this Dharma is so wonderful. He's so interested in it. This Dharma is so wonderful. My parents, you know, they are not interested in it. They don't read. They don't listen to what I tell them to do. So what should I do? I said, don't ask them to read. You read. You read this book. They are watching. They are watching. You read this book and smile. So interesting. So interesting. <laughs> then don't close it. Then, then leave it like this. Then you go to shopping or wherever you want to go. <laughs> Parents will <laughs> quick, quick, slowly, slowly come and see what is he reading. <laughs> after, after all, we are like monkeys, you know. Yeah. <laughs> all, activity, all activities are imitations. One Tibetan scholar, he said, all imitations are activities. Uh, all, imita all activities are imitations. And whoever does the best imitation is called a scholar. <laughs> That's why Shantidev also said, I have nothing to say which has never been said by others before me. There may be things, but basically we copy each other, we imitate each other, right? The other day I told you about the reference, this research. If you copy from one book, it is plagiarism. If you copy from many books, it is research. <laughs> so basically, you know, <clears throat> yeah, so the point, point is, Remove all these types of lazinesses. Then another type of laziness is discouraging yourself. All these teachings, talk, they really look like very important, but I am not intelligent. I am lazy. I am in, not intelligent. I can't do it. You, 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 you disparage yourself. You look down upon yourself. You belittle yourself. I can't do it. There is also laziness. So don't do that. We all have same brain. And our brain is, your brain is good in one thing, my brain is good in another thing, somebody's brain is good in another thing. So the question is how much we are using our brain. And then also as I said earlier, whether you talk about meditation or using your brain, we are basically making the connection with something. If you make this connection with something repeatedly, you become expert in that. So it's repeatedly doing it. And I've always been telling people that you are, you are the only original copy in this world. You are not a duplicate. You are not photocopy. All of us. All of us. Only copy. Within this six billion human population, you are the only original copy. Right? Which means you have your own special talent, special capacity. You don't have to be the greatest singer because somebody who is very good in singing, if you can't sing like that person, then don't think you are not good. No, that person is good in singing, but you are good in something else. Right? So, so you need to understand your own potential, your own talent. Right? Right? Somebody even described the, the meaning of the word genius. He is a genius. And he said genius is one person born 
99% perspiration. The so-called genius comes through training. Yes, some people are quite intelligent when they were born, but it doesn't mean you can't become like that. You need to do the study, do the training. 99% perspiration, that means working hard. And in my own school, in the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics, I know some monks who are really not so intelligent in the beginning, but they work so hard, they are jumping and debating and shouting and thinking year after year, year after year. And after some years, suddenly, their, their mental capacity almost like blossoms, you know, and they become very good. Right? So, in Buddhism we say, we all have the Buddha nature. The Buddha nature means your mind. Your mind has the capacity to do it. But the problem is we hardly use our mind. We use our senses, especially in today's world. We use our sense consciousnesses, seeing things, listening to things. And the mind inside, the mind itself is almost kept untouched. This is a pity. Because what goes to the next world is not your sense, senses, sense consciousnesses, but your mental consciousness. So if you live in imprint, form a habit on your mind, positive habit, then this mind goes to the next world and, and protect you, help you get liberated and free. Sense consciousnesses, they are more or less dependent on the brain, physical body. So when, when you die, they also disappear. So the mental consciousness, leave an imprint on it. Right? Okay, now question answers, maybe? I'll give you a lot of time now. You can, you can grill me now. Yeah. Hello, thank you, Geshla. Hmm. Uh, so, I don't have a question for you, I have an answer. Oh. <laughs> uh, on, on Wednesday, you asked us all a question. Uh, which are the negative emotions that make us unhappy? Yeah. And make us miserable. So, the one, you know, obviously the headline, the headline um, emotion that makes us unhappy is anger and hate. But I think there's an emotion that we, you know, we, we feel a lot more frequently, and maybe it's sort of lower level, but it's, it's guilt and shame. So even just like half an hour ago, I walked in with my cup, mm. and I realised I already had a cup here. Mm. <laughs> and I felt guilty. I felt guilty because, you know, someone might go without a cup because I've taken two. So I think one that the, the, what that illustrates is that guilt comes from a place of compassion. You know, I'm thinking about others. So I think it's quite an interesting negative emotion, but you know, certainly it creates suffering. Um, and I've got a few examples here, because I've obviously been listening, attentive to you, um, and listening to your words, and reflecting. And so I've written a few examples down which hopefully will imitate what maybe you might say to, to some of these scenarios, if that's okay. So it might take a couple of minutes, but give, give, give you a rest, give your voice a rest. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, we take a simple example like, like chocolate. Okay, I eat, I eat a chocolate bar, I overindulge in chocolate. Okay, that's hard. That's why you look so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I've got, do I get an extra minute for that? There yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gesha. Um, yeah, so I overindulge in chocolate, and then you know, I feel guilty, and I think to myself, well, that's, that's out of compassion for myself. You know, I don't, I don't want to get fat. I don't want diabetes. You know, I'm educated. I know the consequence of this. So, that's sort of, so, so I look at the root cause of it, 
of, of that guilt, and it's and it, and it is you know it's, it's it's education. You know, I understand that it's bad for me. Um, then take another an example. Let's say, for example, I've been unskillful in some words or actions uh, with a friend, um, and then obviously I feel some guilt, remorse, even. There's another word for it. I feel some remorse. Uh, but I can put that right. You know, I've, I've upset someone. Or I think I've upset someone. Um, and I think they're suffering, and now I'm suffering. So I can put that right. I can go, go to them and say, look, uh, I'm, I'm sorry about yesterday, and have that dialogue. And hopefully they accept my apology and explanation, or maybe they don't, but, you know, I've done my best. Um, and then the, the third one I've written down here is, is, you know, I guess a very common one for everyone here, you know, not doing enough to help others. You know, obviously in day to day we try and help others in little ways, but, you know, we all think, I imagine everyone here feels the same. We can do more. We can do more volunteer work. You know, we can quit our job in a corporation and work for a charity. You know, take that little hour. So, you know, I feel suffering for that. I'm sure we do of suffering for guilt. We should, we should be doing more. But then again, using our, our brain, we say, hold on, I'm doing some things, you know, I'm giving some money, I'm doing some volunteer work. And a bit like... Um, you know, the, the, the question from, from, the, from the internet earlier, mm. you know, you, you, there's only so much you can do to help, help the animals of the world. Mm. And you've also, as you say, you've got to look after yourself. You don't want to help, help, help the animals so much you end up getting bitten and contracting rabies. So there's obviously a balance there. You've got to be intelligent about how much effort you put into helping others as well. But, you know, you're still feeling that guilt. And I'm sure... <clears throat> I don't want to, maybe you feel guilt sometimes. You talked about helping, you know, the children of Tibet. Sometimes maybe you feel you could do more. And, and, and I don't know how you, you deal with that, but ultimately you have to process it. <coughs> you have to process that somehow. And whether you push it down, I mean, you did use the word suppress. And that may be, that may be right at some points to suppress it. Because otherwise, you know, you know, we could just be in a, people just end up in a kind of, you know, overwhelmed by sadness and, and, and guilt. Yes. And I think just the broader point, <coughs> one last, the fourth example I've got here, which is quite a contemporary phenomenon, is people feeling guilty for the sins of our fathers. Uh, it feels quite new to me. Like my parents, my grandparents, they're proud of being from the country I'm from. But sometimes I feel in this day and age, we're encouraged to feel guilt <coughs> for the sins of our fathers. Let's say the empires and we're... You know, and even you mentioned yesterday. You mentioned yesterday, your ancestors were the Mongols. I mean, effectively the Tibetans, so it just committed some awful, awful, awful crimes as well, and, and and created a lot of suffering in the world. So I guess I'm interested to hear how much are we responsible for things that are out of our control? You know, the actions of our, our fathers, because because the people who are feeling most guilty for these kind of things that they can't control are the ones who are the most compassionate and the most sensitive. So I think I'll wrap up there and, um, yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts on, yeah, guilt? Um, whether you want to use any of those scenarios or? Yeah, good. Thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful. So, guilt, in Buddhism we use the word regret, something like guilt. So in Buddhism we say, if you, if you have done something good, for example, attending this teaching here, and then later on if you regret, oh, I wish I should not have gone to this, this retreat. Instead, if I have worked back in my home, I must have earned more money. Now not only I'm unable to earn money, I lost a lot of money traveling to Dharamsala and then, you know, things like that. So that kind of regret or guilt is said to be negative. A wrong feeling of guilty or wrong regret. Now if you have done something wrong, right? Uh, for example, killing somebody, right? Then uh, later on you, you feel sorry, you regret. That, that was that was big mistake. So that is good. 
So with bad things, having done bad things, if you regret it, it's good. Having done good things, if you regret it, that is wrong. That's one way of explaining. Then second with this word guilt, which we don't use much in, in Buddhism. Sometimes, according to my understanding, some people when they talk about guilt, they say it in the context of thinking that I've done something wrong and now I can never purify it. So that kind of thinking is again in Buddhism is wrong. Because whatever kind of wrong things you have done, it can always be purified. So there is no permanent damnation, permanent hell, no. Impermanent hell. <laughs> Changing, I think it's good. That's one thing, I think. Then second, you know, you need to realize there are things you can do, there are things you can, cannot do. So there are things that you can do, try your best. Even there, you may not be able to do everything, but try your best to do those things. There are things which you can't do, then you just pray. I wish I can do, but I can't do. It's none of your fault. The situation is such that you can't do anything right now. So just just do some prayer and wish that in this way or that way, one day I will be able to do something for the goodness. That's one way of thinking. Then, about apology, that you, you, you pick up a fight with somebody, right? Or me, you make a mistake, a misunderstanding. Then it's very important to say sorry. Learn to say sorry is very, 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 very important. If you get the courage to say, I'm sorry. That is a solution for many problems. Because normally both the sides never say sorry. Just keep on saying, I'm right, you're wrong. You go to hell. I will go to heaven. <laughs> like that. That is the problem. And then, then this, this phenomenon of not being to acknowledge one's you know, mistakes. Or, or being a part of that broil, whatever. It's very interesting, you know. They, that's why in Buddhism we say negative emotions have a predominant presence in us. We are habituated with it for many lives. It's not easy to get rid of it. For example, if I have a misunderstanding with one of my close friends this morning, this, this friend, my close friend, I say close friend because let us say this person has been my very close friend for the last 35 years. We were like just one person. But this morning, unfortunately, we had some misunderstanding and some conflict. Say five minutes conflict. Right? Then after this conflict, the interesting thing now you see, after this fight and conflict, I am able to see very clearly, remember very clearly what he said, the nasty things he said, nasty things he did during these five minutes. <coughs> and I am not able to remember the good things that he, he has done on the last 35 years. So the important thing is, Yes, you had some misunderstanding, but that was just for five minutes. So immediately try to recall that 35 years a long friendship. Recall that and then say sorry and hug that person. It may be your mistake, it may be my mistake, but we had this unpleasant thing happened. So I'm extremely sorry. If it's my mistake, forgive me. If you are able to do that, you are the real hero. And you will, be, you will be able to continuously maintain that friendship. But how many of us can do that? And if you do that, actually you are the winner. You did not lose your friendship. You won. But normally, we think, oh, if I say sorry, it means I am the loser, you know. He's the winner. 
I don't want to lose. I want to stand on my ground. <laughs> right? So at the end, the end, you lose your friendship. So it's important. But of course, again, you have to judge the situation. For some people, if you say sorry, they'll become more arrogant. So therefore, in Buddhism, proper harmonious use of head and heart, compassion and wisdom is important. When we encourage you to practice compassion, we are not saying you become a doormat, where everybody clean their feet, right? So sometimes, inside, you must have this feeling of compassion and love to others, but because of that person's behavior, attitude, sometimes you need to be a little bit tough. Externally, you need to be tough. And in, in my work, I have to do this, not regularly, but occasionally. Because some people, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, some people, their mind is not functioning well. <laughs> so, they're so I, mean, I understand so many different people, but if you try to say, I have compassion and just keep on with this person, this person will keep on circling around you. And they come in such a way that they say, it's so good, and the library is so good. And they keep on circling around you. What, what are you going to do with this person? You know? So you need to maintain a little bit distance. And then, then there are some people who are really crazy. They keep on going there, then shouting and doing things. If you pay attention, they get more emboldened. They do many things. Nasty things. So you need to be a little bit yamantaka, you know, rough. <laughs> a little bit toughness. And if there's a way, you can help, help. Otherwise, make some, give some distance. So we are all ordinary human beings, you know. So therefore, Kamala Shila, a very famous Indian teacher, who wrote this three-part stages of meditation. And His Holiness gave many teachings, especially the middling stages of meditation, which I had the fortune to translate. And a book has been published, Stages of Meditation. So there he says, when it comes to Making human relationship, it should be like your relation with the fire. With the fire, if you go too close, it will burn you. If you stay too far away, you will not get the warmth. Right? We have all emotional needs, emotional problems, you know. <laughs> so sometimes, <laughs> you know, coming too close is not that good. And staying too far away, also undesirable, you know, <laughs> maybe not so good. So keep a distance. That's why in, 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 in Tibetan tradition we have this saying, the d blessing of a Lama is greater from a distance. That's why you are here, you know, receiving teaching from His Holiness. So His Holiness is really now wonderful for you. Because you came with such a wonderful attitude and... Uh, but if you spend a long, long time, live here, then you may not have that, that appreciation. Right? Okay, next. <coughs> Please only the people who have asked me not um, ask any questions or <coughs> Thank you, Geshe-la, for mm. the wonderful and very helpful teachings. Mm. Um, I just wanted to ask, how can a mantra, or a very specific mantra, like with relation to Yamandaka or other deities, how can that be helpful to protect oneself from so-called bad people, bad people in that sense that they evoke uh, negative emotions within ourselves? How can we... Not, not just mantra, there are many mantras. But the most important thing is, there is a book. There is a book called How to Deal with Bad People. 
Yeah. There is a book, How to Deal with Bad People, and the subtitle is, The, the Way to Deal with Bad People is Plan B. <laughs> so there is a Plan B. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, not necessarily you read this book, but the important thing is, as I already mentioned, sometimes keeping a little bit distance away from these people. Yeah, I said, yeah, I told you this also, that the people who you want to meet, you never meet, people you don't want to meet, they're always waiting at the corner. <laughs> that is also possible, that's also possible. Then I, I told you this example of uh, uh, the terrifying person becoming your next door neighbor. You think, think about that, <laughs> a little bit about that, right? And then, then if you want to recite the mantra, then... Uh, this is the the mantra of Heart Sutra is very good. Teyatha Om Gati Gati Par Gati Par Sangati Bodhisattva. That is very good. And then also the mantra of Tara, Tara Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Swaha. Yeah, those. Things. Sorry, how should we? How should we practice the mantra? Oh, you read a little bit about Tara. For example, Tara. In the case of Tara, she is the the embodiment of energy. Meaning that whatever you expect and wish, it will be swiftly achieved because of her quick response. So therefore, uh, read a little bit about Tara. And uh, if you're more serious, then one day you should receive the, the, the initiation, Tara initiation. And uh, otherwise also you can, you can recite the mantra. Yeah. How fast is the mantra? As I said already, the way to protect from any negative thing is your mind. When your mind likes a particular tantra, then the number one factor is your mind, thinking that I will be protected. That's the main cause. The second, as I already mentioned, the power of mantra is unthinkable, I mentioned already. It's, a, it's almost like a magic formula, you know. In, in the laboratory, when you mix many chemicals together, it can create so many things. So similarly, in the realm of spiritual practice also, these mantras are like magic formulas, blessed by accomplished masters in the past. So they have their own efficacy. But I would say it is primarily your mind. If you, your mind has not much appreciation about tantra, mantra, things like that, then it will have not much effect. Right? Okay, where are we now? <clears throat> Have you raised a question before? Oh, yes. Uh, could you please just raise if you haven't uh, asked a question? <laughs> Thank you. Yeshla, thank you for mm. your dharma, mm. and this is priceless. Um, I have an ob observation. I've uh, been around the Theravada teachings, and uh, now comparing it to uh, Vajrayana, I've noticed that in the but Rayana of Vina is not uh, quite adhered to, quite neglected. Mm -hmm. uh, Vinaya, the monastic code of mm. conduct. And um, by looking at monks, uh, if you uh, permit my judgment, we all live in the dualistic world, uh, I found out that uh, the monks are quite... Um, and mindful also, compared to Theravada ones. Compared to Theravada monks? Yes. I see. Mm. On the other hand, uh, uh, Tibetan monks seem to be more easygoing, mm -hmm. happy, at least on the surface. Mm. 
Well, it uh, seems, like, seems to be like a genuine happiness. Well, there, there is a lot going on in the Theravadan community, of course, which is, which is covered behind the, behind the curtains. But um, that's a bit con contradictory to my mind because uh, uh, mindfulness is quite important even uh, in understanding of uh, shunyata and being neglected so much, again, from my perspective, is a bit... Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so according to, if you want to do a complete practice, then even in accordance with the Tibetan Buddhist teaching, it says, externally sarvakayana. That means teravat, externally, in terms of your conduct, behavior, you know, more disciplined. Internally, bodhisattvayana. Mentally, you should think about achieving Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. Secretly, tantra. Secretly. So that means tantra, tantra is also called the mantra, which is said to be a secret practice. Not, not, it is not secret because there are some, you know, wrong teachings there. But it's, it is a secret because it may not be very useful for those whose mind is not uh, prepared. Especially using your energies, nerves, chakras, and things like that. And also when you see the, some of the images, men, male and female deities in union, if you have no understanding then you might think this is not tantra, this is sexology. Right? So therefore, secretly. Now among the people, I, I, I don't want to make a judgment. There are many stupid monks in Thai, you know, the Theravada tradition also. There are many stupid monks in the Tibetan tradition also. We are all, whether you call it monk or not, we are human beings. We are all the same. Right? Then, uh, so I don't know. This is a good observation. I, I never observed or tried to observe like that. This is a good, good observation because of certain habits and traditions, there may be differences. But one that you noticed may be true. Tibetan monks are more open-minded. That is, I think, true. Because it's not only Tibetans, but the Tibetan monks, but Tibetans in general are relatively open-minded. Happy, quite happy. Even though they've lost their country, still you will see every day singing and dancing, you know. Right? So, so open-mindedness is there, which is, which is very good for one, one's health and friendship and things like that. That is there. That is there. But, but the, the important thing is the, the individual practitioner. Because among monks also, like me, who are unable to practice, there are many, many who are not only not able to practice, but also do many bad things also. They're there everywhere. Same. So therefore, we are repeatedly instructed don't don't give a big gap between the dharma and the person. <laughs> the person should practice it, right? All right, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Hello. Mm. Um, so I have a question to yesterday at the Dalai Lama. There mm. was this one beautiful mantra in the end um, where lots of people started um, singing, like chanting the mantra as well. I was wondering which one mantra that was and what was the meaning of it. Which one? Mixema, Mixema. This is the. Yeah, this is the. I I actually told you the other day. This is the four line, four line uh, praise to Tsongkhapa, who wrote this book. Ming Min Sebe Terchin Chin Resi. You are the Avalokiteshvara, who has this uh, non-observing great compassion, and you are the Manjushri, who opposes. Uh, uh, stainless omniscience and you are the Vajrapani who destroys all evil forces uh, and you are the crown of jewel of the land of snow 
I pay homage to you, Tsongkhapa. That is the mantra. So normally, uh, around the end of the year, there, there comes his special, you know, festival. So then people really chant this. They go around the temple. <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. Like that, you know, they did. <laughs> Today my voice is not that good. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Huh? Okay, next question. Huh? Mixema. Mixema. M I G T S E M A. Mixema. M I G T S E M A. Mixema. <laughs> okay. Next. <laughs> Um, I had a question about Dzogchen. Mm. Um, bef before you just spoke about the risks of um, taking on tantric practices before mm. uh, you might be ready. And mm. from what I understand, Dzogchen is also considered yeah. a higher practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, these ideas are also becoming mm. much more widely available in the West yeah. these days through Western yeah. teachers. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's also in the past few months actually really supported my practice or my understanding of how things exist, I found it really helpful and really resonated. But I was wondering um, yeah, what your thoughts were on the risks of taking on this approach or these well, actually, practices too soon. Actually, the most important thing is uh, you should have genuine faith and respect. That must be there. If you have that, then it's, not, it's okay. Because the text itself, it has nothing, you know, uh, bad or wrong, right? The text itself is fine, but the only, we say the risk, because if you try to understand it without relying on qualified teacher, you may misunderstand it. There's the, there's the main risk. Otherwise, it should be okay if you have that genuine wish and faith, and especially if you have quite a good understanding of these three things that we discussed, emptiness, renunciation, bodhicitta, then I think it, there's no, not much harm in the reading that. Okay, it's, it's not a poisonous snake, you know, you touch it and then it will bite you, <laughs> it's not, not like that. It's only a, a warning. And then, then this days, people really want to overreach things, you know, they don't want to go from the lower level, they just want to fly. <laughs> mm. So, so in flying also, these days flying is also relatively safer than traveling by car. But if there is an accident, 100% sure. <laughs> so it is something like that. Okay. Can, can you uh, say a little bit more about why it's considered one of the higher practices than in Tibetan Buddhism, Dzogchen? Higher practices because in the Sutra practices, you, you primarily practice the causes and conditions for achieving enlightenment. Like bodhicitta, renunciation, emptiness that we are talking These are causes for becoming Buddhahood. We are talking about the causes, right? When you do the tantric practice, of course, as a preliminary to your tantric practice, you need the sutric practices. But in the tantric practice, you primarily visualize yourself as the Yamantaka, as the deity. Right? So there, if you don't have proper understanding of Shunyata, like for example, if I say, okay, I'm the Yamantaka now. 
doesn't mean anything. You also imagine yourself completely green or blue or yellow. <laughs> it's just a joke. It means nothing. Right? And then, so therefore, when we, when we do this tantric visualization, then we do it with the help of you know, reflections by reciting mantra like, mantras like Om Sova Bhava Shud. This is Sanskrit mantra. Om Sova Bhava Shud. Sarva Dharma Sova Bhava Shud. Om Sova Bhava Shud. The word Om, as I explained in the context of mantra Om Mani Peme Hung, Om means body, speech, and mind, which means person. Om means I. Sova Bhava means Sova Bhava. Nature. So Baba should I am by nature clean. That means I am devoid of inherent existence. Now, you, because you are devoid of inherent existence, you become flexible. You know, you can create anything. So with this understanding, by nature, I'm completely free from independent existence. I can't pinpoint anything having independent existence. You search from the top of your head down to the sole of your feet, you search where is Geshe Lagdo, you don't find anything. Through this search, when you, you, when you go into the, that state of vacuity, not being able to find, that is the ground for imagining yourself as a deity. Then you think, okay, from that state, that state of emptiness, I arise as Avalokiteshvara, I arise at Yamintaka, like that, right? And then there are many other practices involving, as I said, your channels, drops, you know. So this has to be done properly. Otherwise, it may not be very beneficial. And in fact, some, sometimes it may harm you also. Not somebody coming to harm you, but because of your wrong practice. Th that is the thing, yeah. Okay. Yes, where is it now? Many hands here. Uh, thank you, Geshe mm -hmm. Um I have a question to the evil mind. Um, if I understand it right, that the evil mind is... What? Evil mind. Oh, okay. Huh? Okay. Um, like, so first of all, is uh, like, do I understand the evil mind as like, anger, judge, like the negative emotions. Yeah. And how does it come from? Like, not from now, I mean from the beginning of human beings. How does this evolve that we just created this negative emotion? Yeah, as I explained yesterday, one is this, it's related to our <laughs> reproduction, and protection, as I said. Right? So we are more familiar with those things which is more immediately needed. Nothing to do with the long-term happiness. Immediately needed. Immediately I need to marry and produce children. Immediately I need to protect myself from the harms from the enemy. So that, that, is, that, is, that was what the animals were doing. And we have inherited that brain. So therefore, more, you are more into these things. And that is what you see in, the, in all the movies. If you watch any movie, most of the movies, the main theme is either violence, dagu, violence or sex. If that is there, the movie is colorful, so good. If that is not there, then Movie is not colorful, meaning that if we engage in these things, then the life looks colorful, you know, you become active. If there's not there, the life looks like luster. So that's why some, some people say, this monk's life, you know, such, such, such a colorless life. You can't do this, you can't do that, colorless, right? But the response is, it may be colorless, but it is steady. There's not too much ups and downs, you know, you, when you engage in violence and all those other things, there's too much ups and downs, too much fighting. For men-women relationship, wars have been fought. Stories, history is replete with 
<coughs> those things. Then arrogance, anger, even today you can see. So because of this we say this is bad, negative. We should reduce it. Right? Okay, yeah. This <laughs> is very strict. <laughs> Please, can you help me to thank you so much? Kishan, uh, I found your explanations and Buddhism in general uh, so far is very like logical, uh, direct, and I think it's like not superstitious at all. Yeah. But then. Uh, when I sign up for the uh, holiness, uh, His Holiness uh, uh, spe uh, public speaking, and also at Tushita, there is this uh, requirement. If you are a practitioner of this something, uh, uh, then you, you are requested not to, to participate in the public teaching or at Tushita. Okay, so, and then I look it up on, on the internet, what it's all about. So, as far as I remember, it's like, so a long time ago, there is a fight between the Dalai Lama and this, this being, and then this being was defeated, okay? And so that's the, the, the brief story. Yeah. And so my question is like, it seems like there is a part of Buddhism that is very logical and very, uh, uh, I would say, secular. Yes. But at the same time, there is this cult of like superstitious part. Yeah, yeah. Could you explain more about that? <laughs> As, as I said yesterday, <laughs> politics is not dirty. Politicians are dirty. Therefore, politics become dirty politics. And religion also, you know, not dirty. But in the wrong hand of so-called religious people, it also become dirty. Right? So therefore, the yardstick whether you are doing the right practice or not, should be the Buddha's own teaching. Not even His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know. If people say, okay, this is the controversy between the Dalai Lama and the other thing, then you can't use His Holiness as the yardstick. Use Buddha's teaching. The Buddha's teaching has no room for blind faith. So in this practice, there's a lot of blind faith, unfortunately. Because the Buddhist teaching says, if you want to be happy, change your mind, transform your mind, help others. Then on the other hand, I mean, it's not only those, those controversies, but even otherwise, people who say, okay, if you practice this deity, that deity, controversial or not controversial, I don't, I, 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 I don't know, but if you say, then everything will be okay. Just just pray to this day, everything will be okay. There are statements, things like that, but if your mind is very pure, maybe if the, the deity is also the right deity, maybe. But the main thing is, if you really want to purify, I don't think any deity can, they can give you some blessing and things like that, that is there. Uh, that also, whether you receive the blessing or not, is also dependent upon your mental attitude, <laughs> purity of your mind. Right? So His Holiness was saying, if that deity or something is a really correct deity, good deity, you don't have to, you know, uh, propitiate propici propici it. The good deity is actually, I mean, it's not saying that you don't make contact, things like that. The, the job of the good Dharma protector is that they have in the past made a vow to protect all those who are on the right track, who are doing good things. It is not that those who will praise and you know make offerings will be protected, and if those who don't do it will not be protected. That's what he's only saying. If you say that those who don't you know propitiate, don't you know, make offerings, they will be harmed, they will be destroyed. That means something is wrong. Like Buddha himself, you know, whether it is said that Buddha, on his two sides, there are two people. One who don't like Buddha, so he is a sharp knife. 
and cuts Buddha's body in, in into pieces. Then on the other side, somebody who likes Buddha and anoints his body with the sandal, sandal uh, oil and massages his body <laughs> like that. The Buddha will see no difference between these two. So even if you are not at the level of the Buddha, but if you are the right deity, then that, w- that will m- not make any discrimination. Even among the teachers, if the teacher is a good qualified teacher, that teacher should not make discrimination between those people who made you offerings and those people who did not make your offerings. But this is hard also. But those people who make more offering, more contact, you will make contact with them, others you. <laughs> so this is a, the human problem, human problem. But His Holiness, the main concern is that in Buddhism, you know, the, the, the main practice is believing in the law of causality, karma and their result. Not seeing a particular deity, whichever, as the creator. This, that's the reason in Buddhism we don't believe in a creator God. So now suddenly if you come with a practice where you say, okay, if you practice this deity, you know, that deity will shower upon you all the blessings, you will be protected, you will reach and all those things. So His Holiness is saying that is, that is wrong. And having said this, that His Holiness said, my job is to give you the direction, advice. Maybe it is up to you whether to follow it or not follow it. So therefore His Holiness, of course, cannot pass a law, you know, punish things like that. He said, it's up to you. The only thing I can say is, if you still continue to practice this, then don't receive my teaching. Because there has to be this clear bond, pure bond. If you say, do something which you ask not to do, and then also come for teaching, then there is a breach of purity of the bond. So he told me, said, this, this much I can say. Right? Something like that. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> Is it on? Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Gershala, for your mm-hmm. teaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a question on karma. Uh, when we do practices like Tonglen, mm-hmm. how does it work? Um, like, can we... Pr- by practicing, um, have an influence on the karmic imprints of people who are suffering or are creating suffering uh, right now, or also of people who already died. Uh, can we lessen the karmic imprints or the bad It karma? depends upon your spiritual level. If you're on a very high spiritual level, you may make some influence, but otherwise not. But it's good for you. So it's for us. Yes, maybe. absolutely. Okay. Otherwise, one has to experience one's own negative fruit of negative karma. No, nobody, you know, somebody just keeps on going to the bad karma, and then somebody does a prayer and purify. That's very easy. That's like bribing. You can't do that. If you read this story of uh, one geshe, who was very arrogant and he was very jealous of Milarepa who was such a totally dedicated practitioner. And he was very jealous. And then he tried to, many times tried to poison him and then tried to kill him, things like that. Then at the end, uh, he used one woman and he said, you, you put poison in the, in the yoga cart and give it to Milareva. And uh, then if you're uh, successful in doing that, then, then I'll marry you and give you all my wealth and things like that. So this lady attempted many times, and then at the end, Milareva said, I know who, who sent you. I know what are you up to. So, no problem. So he took it. He didn't die, of course. Then, uh, then uh, this, this uh, Geshe, he also at one point came to meet Milareva, pretending he is very, you know, uh, respectful, Things like that. And that time Milareva was actually, yes, I think with that poison, he was sick. He did not die, but he was sick. And then he said, I wish, he pretended that he, he is not involved with that. I wish I can take your illness with me. And Milareva said, don't, don't say things like that. Don't say things like that. You, will, you cannot take other people's, 
you know, fruit of negative karma with you. He said, no, 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 I, I, if, if there is a possibility, I want to take it. Then, then he transferred a little of that illness on him, a little bit, just a tiny little bit. It was so painful. He could not tolerate it. The Malay River said, see, now I, I will transfer it on the rock. And he said the rock split into many parts. I mean, this may be just an example, but, uh, but you cannot. Similarly, like compassion, when you develop compassion, how nice all these sentient beings are without suffering, that will help you maintain your mental calmness and it will also inspire you to actually do things for others wherever there is a possibility. But otherwise, it just by thinking may not have much effect to others, but you are the beneficiary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Geshla, thank mm. you. So I have a question about euthanasia, mm. assisted dying. Mm. Um, so um, usually the decision is made by a relative or person to, out of love or compassion to end the suffering. And um, I'm just wondering from a, a Buddhist perspective, um, whether it um, disturbs the dying process in any way, um, the, the normal, the natural dying process, and um, whether it takes, um, how to say, whether it takes the opportunity of um, that person or animal to um, get rid of negative karma by suffering more, if you know what I mean, understand. No, although we do say that by suffering some of your karmas are purified, but that does not mean to say that you should always suffer, you know, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So this is tricky, controversial or tricky with this mercy killing or euthanasia. Theoretically, it can be practiced, but practically not easy because you can't read the actual state of the mind of that dying person. That person may be looking like he is in coma, but still he may be able to do some positive thinking, things like that, right? And uh, then it may also end up committing killing. So you have to be the best, best as, as, as far as I understand, the best thing is to let that person die a natural death. But then as I said, sometimes the person doesn't die and very expensive to maintain you know a lot of problem with the family so I don't know <laughs> so I don't know so th theoretically possible but practically not that easy so even if you do you should just judge very 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 carefully I mean, these are these are interesting new things you know that person is there in the coma state for a long time, then suddenly just pulled it out and... Yeah. Okay. There is one here. This last two days that we went out from the Dushita, uh, my brain was thinking, oh, I am free, I can do whatever, whatever I want. So I ate paneer paranta. Oh. I, <laughs> I, I, I smoked one cigarette and almost I drink a coffee. So I am curious about if there is any Buddhist practice to reduce desire that I can use in the moment to reduce the desire for things. Reduce what? Desire. Desire? Yes. So? So, 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 so the question is what? <laughs> what did you say? You, you want like, to... breathing can be useful for relaxing. There is a um, technique that monks use for reduce desire. 
Huh? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get rid of what? <laughs> go and have a smoke, go and have, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, have a cigarette, have a cup of coffee, go and have lunch out. out when, on, when? Yesterday or the day before, I guess, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. So? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think he would like to know how to be very pure and good and not want any of those things, even though he wasn't inside of Tushita. No, this, this is the two, two things. <laughs> One, when you are attending such a conference, then the organizers are doing their best to, to come up with something good. So they are saying, at least, at least while you are here, don't do these things. The reason is, by doing that, you may be able to completely give up those bad habits later on also. It happens with many of His Holiness teachings, you know. They are so inspired, then people give up cigarette smoking, people give up eating meat. Many people do that for the rest of their life. So that may be one reason, right? And then the second thing is, for a long time also, when you are deprived of those things in which you are more or less addicted, it's a little bit painful, you know. In those areas where you are, you know, addicted, it will come into your mind again and again. You see? You miss it. You want to enjoy, what do you say, paneer paranda, something like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> First, when I heard about that, I thought, oh, you ate paneer par parota and now you are sick or something like that. <laughs> so luckily you are not dead. Anyway, so, yeah, so, so, this kind of retreat gives you an opportunity to reflect and think about the badness of getting addicted to anything. It's painful. When you don't have it, you, it's painful. If you're not addicted, you have it, okay. You don't have it, okay. There's no pain, you see. So this is a learning thing, right? So they're not saying they, they can't order or that you stop it right away. They may not be, but they're giving you an opportunity. So now it is up to you to think and uh, if you find anything which is not helpful, not good, slowly reduce the consumption and then stop it. Because cigarette smoking, you know, for example, I'm not pointing towards you, but in general, cigarette smoking, I find it. I also took a puff one time. <laughs> when I was uh, just a little kid, somebody who smoked, the, the cigarette butt was there still with smoke. So out of curiosity, I took just one puff <laughs> and I coughed so much, you know. <laughs> that was the only time I have experienced. But otherwise, now when I think, I I really feel it very stupid. Because you know all these fragile internal things and you are, you are puffing smoke after smoke. What are you, what are you doing? What is your plan? <laughs> <laughs> to <laughs> to suffocate yourself, and better you go to a chimney, you know. <laughs> then you get more, <laughs> get more, you know. I remember one goat, you know. It's very funny. When I was studying in the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics, there was a black goat. She would always come near the chimney and then, you know, smoke this, this, that smoke and do like this, and uh, uh, then do like this. Uh. <laughs> really, I've seen it, you know. So even, it's not only human being, you know, some of them, they also like smoke. But if you think carefully, you know, now these days they demonstrate these things, you know. They demonstrate these things. If you uh, take a, what you call it, a sponge and put it on a dirt, and then you can see how much dirt it takes. So it's like that, you see. It's like, if you don't understand, now they explain this by showing the chimney. Look inside the chimney where the smoke went. And gradually, so much so that gradually it gets blocked. We have to clear it. So the same thing is happening with this, <laughs> this tiny, fragile human, you know, in, in internal organs. So that's really like, not at all, nothing to do with religious practice. For your own health, you know. This is not good at all. But having said that, there are 
really great smokers who smoked their whole life and still healthy. There are people like that also. And when you talk about the badness of the cigarette, they, they will say, what? I've been smoking all my life. See, look, I'm fit. <laughs> but these are rare exceptions. <laughs> Not applicable to everybody. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yes. There are two here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there are some philosophy which describes oneness uh, as it is, like there are no difference between you, me, table, these words, or everything. Like we are all the same. Is there a same uh, understanding in Buddhism? I know it's not Buddhism philosophy, but similar things. No, when we say oneness, sameness, or similarity, we are talking about certain features where there is sameness, oneness. Not completely same. Because my voice, your voice is not same. I don't have a mouse stage, you have a mouse stage. Right? So like that. So there are so many differences. And then these differences are not necessarily like bad. It's actually good. But the important thing is, we are t when we talk about sameness, we are primarily talking about the main feature. Like as we already discussed about emptiness, you are having no independent existence, I ha having no independent existence. There we are co completely same in that sense. Then you are wishing happiness, not wanting suffering, me also same. So on the bigger, but they are the, on, the, on the conventional level, as I already mentioned, on the conventional level, there are differences. There are varieties. There are colors, shapes, things like that. But on the ultimate truth, None of us have independent existence. So sameness on that level. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Hello. Mm. Firstly, mm. I just want to say to Chi Che. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, means thank you in Tibetan, just about. Um, I'm interested in polarities and particularly, well, I guess like if we didn't, like the sun didn't disappear every night, perhaps we wouldn't appreciate it um, as much. And so with suffering, is there a case for actually welcoming it and having gratitude towards our suffering? because we wouldn't be able to know what yeah, happiness yeah. feels like. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> but, but when we say kind of like, may all beings be free of suffering, that's almost pointing towards eradicating it completely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering. Yeah, yeah there, is, there is one, in fact, there is one <coughs> mind training text where it says, if it is better for me to die, let me die. If it's better for me to suffer, let me suffer. Right? And he says, in fact, he's, he puts it so nicely. If I become sick, it is wonderful. Because when you get sick, you will stop doing many negative things. And if you die, it is even better. Then, then you put a complete stop in doing all the negative things. But that is not pessimistic. And then he again in the same vein he says, if I don't get sick or if I don't die, if I remain very healthy and live a long life, wonderful. Then I live a long healthy life and do all these wonderful Dharma practices. <laughs> so, so whatever, for a good practitioner, whatever comes is wonderful. So for many of these practitioners, when you talk about suffering, they, they will love at it. What do you mean by suffering? Where is suffering? This is, this is to say that the so-called suffering is basically your mental attitude, how you see things. The same thing can be source of suffering for one, for another that can be source of happiness. Depending upon your disease, for a diabetic, sweet is suffering. Somebody who is healthy, 
enjoy that. So it depends. What what is your state? Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have you asked a question before? Um, anyone has a question that hasn't uh, asked any question? No, 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 no second question, no, maybe. <laughs> So I, I g- oh. it's okay, okay, okay. Ask, ask. Uh, I guess um, my question is is like uh, about suffering, and uh, is that to say that some practitioners are able to, let's say, get cut severely? I mean, where potentially they would have to go to the hospital, get stitches. Oh, many. Anything yes, like that, course. and they still don't feel yes. the physical pain from. I I know too. At least two, three, personally. It's very interesting. There's one very senior teacher from the same monastery. He was, uh, he become, later became the abbot of that Depong Losiling monastery, Gyi He was a great teacher, qualified teacher, a senior person. So he was teaching in America. So Professor Jeffrey Hopkins and many others are his student. So he got cancer when he was in America. So his holiness was visiting there. Then this, this venerable monk came to see his holiness. I was told Professor Jeffrey Hopkins, who is his student, he also came with him. Then his holiness said, come back to India. Then I was told this, this professor, he requested his holiness not to say things like that. He said, here in America we have better medical facilities, but still here it is declared that he, this venerable will now live only for three months. The doctor said he will live only three months. And then this teacher scolded his student by saying, his holiness knows better than you. I'm going back to India. We came back to India and spent almost one year in Dharamsala. I didn't die in three months spent almost one year in Dharamsala and uh, at one point he, he said when I eat you know it looks like there is some obstruction so I need to I, I think that I need to do some operation he only said did some divination said go ahead he went to Delhi I think Delhi did some operation and where it is said half of his stomach was cut but he was able to take food as before and his attendant a tall monk, I, I know him, he's, he's, he's also Geshe. He used to tell his, his brother, you know, elder brother, he said, how can you eat so much? Now half of your stomach is already gone. And he used to say, you see, I can eat, so I'm eating. <laughs> so then after a while he said, now I'm just wasting my time here. I want to go back to the monastery and teach. He went back to Nepung Losaleng Monastery, maybe started teaching, I don't know how long. But uh, then he uh, relapsed and got the cancer and spread it all over, you know. Then he was suddenly brought from Bangalore to New Delhi. Then in the evening, the night, at 2 p.m., he got up from his bed and he, and he instructed his students to change the direction of his bed. And then he gave his parting advice by saying, that now I have, you know, no debt to be, you know, paid to anybody, money or things like that. So he gives some instruction, I don't know the detail. Then his brother, who was his main attendant, then many other senior attendants were there. He was staying with this one very senior monk, Dhamma he was also there. Then this, some of them started crying. And then especially his, his I think, brother, the Gishi, he requested, Please, please come back. We want your reincarnation. Then this monk said, after I die, if you pick up a boy who don't even know how to clean his nose and call that my reincarnation, that will be the greatest disgrace you can do for me. I have no reincarnation, nothing. 
Then he, then he passed away that very night. Interestingly, already unarranged, there was this whole group of monks from Upper Tantri College. They were to go for some performance in America. They were in, in Manjunikatila. So the next day, they invited all these monks, did all the Guha Samaja, you know, practice and uh, things like that. So when he came back to India in New Delhi, we would walk together. So already he's saying, we always talk about death, 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 but when the death is actually coming, it's not so easy. <laughs> Meaning that he must be thinking about all those things. So that is the story, you see. Then I, I know another, another monk who had some, maybe cancer or some boil here. He was the Gandhian throne holder, one of the top most. So I know him, you know, not very closely, but I, I recognize him. So later on, some people told me that when he was in his own room with his attendants, he would not say a word with this problem. But when he goes to the doctor, then he says, please do something. This is so painful. So, so painful. But he would not say a word about his pain to his students, things like that. So there are people <laughs> who can do that. Yeah. Okay, so I have answered all the questions. Oh, no. <laughs> I thought I settled all the matters. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I have a question about morals like right and wrong, good and bad, mm. and how this relates to emptiness and mm. correct perception. I've spent quite some time around Zen teachers, mm. and there it's a lot of talk about not making good and bad, not making beautiful and ugly, but rather just seeing things as they are and a focus on correct view and from their correct action. Mm. And we have talked a lot about uh, negative versus positive emotion, or good versus bad actions, but aren't these relative concepts dependent on perspective and created by the mind? Mm. And how do we navigate mm. this question? Mm. We are talking about all these practices on an ordinary level. On an ordinary level, there is good thing, there is bad thing, there are things that harm you, there are things that help you. So therefore we say this is bad, this is good, because it helps you, it harms you, things on the ordinary level. But, but uh, when you do a meditation on emptiness, when you focus on emptiness, then your mind is totally lost into emptiness, and from that parlance there is nothing good, nothing bad. Right? And then, more importantly, when you become Buddha, there is nothing good, nothing bad. Even when, when, when he says good and bad, it is because of your in accordance with your parlance. For Buddha, even the so-called you know, not so uh, good smell, that we, we think this is very bad smell. For Buddha, it's, there's nothing called bad smell. It's a good smell. Right? So things like that. Right? Yeah. Hmm. Um, thank you. What is your perspective or the Buddhist perspective on nearly death experience and what people sometimes tell you after or the memories? What is your perspective on dreams or dreaming and what does our mind do or why? And does it have a connection or does it have similarities? Like, I mean, the death experience and the dreaming and um, how is our mind acting? In Tibet, not only these days, we have many books on, of, written by people who had near-death near experiences. But in Tibet also we have many people who we call them Delongma. That means somebody returned back from the death. So these people, normally they, they come back completely transformed. And some of these Delongmas, you know, I did not read many of their stories, but I heard some of these Delongma 
they are highly respected in Tibet because they they can they can come back and then they tell all these stories of meeting meeting somebody you know and how to behave how to do things based on his or her own experience so they become very great source of inspiration so similarly in the the, the books written in the west of uh, people who had near death experiences also they are more or less saying the same thing they they come back completely transformed and they say when they when they when they die they enter into a tunnel, light tunnel. And that light tunnel is not hurting, it's very soothing. You, you get a lot of peace. And then at the end of the gate, there is white, white light kind of man who receives you, welcomes you, things like that. You know, I, I don't know the details. I don't know the details. But my presumption is that in Buddhism, when we talk about, you know, death, we have what we call as anti-conceptual thoughts. In the ordinary level, then when we die, that this eighty conceptual thoughts gradually disappear or collapse into one another, and then finally at the end, you what what is remained is just the clear light mind. So here also you can see the use of the word clear light. That clear light mind is basically your original mind. So good meditators practitioners when they die they they try to uh, remain focused on the on their clear light mind and then they use this clear light mind to realize emptiness this is called the meeting of the mother and the son the subjective and the objective you know clear light so that is very important practice for uh, liberation and uh, uh, achieving higher spiritual heights so there may be similarity with that, but I don't know much. We need to do more research on those things. I have some books on near-death experience, but I, I hardly read the first two pages. <laughs> and they long also, I just heard, you know, I did not read anything. Yeah. But, but the important thing is, the, more, the real important issue is, you need to know about these things much in advance. So that when, when you are dying, you, you understand what what where what is the stage where you are now? So in the tantric practice it says the four elements dissolve one into another. One into another simply means not like what fire becoming water, water becoming wind, not like that. But the fire, the presence of fire becomes disappears, and the presence of water becomes more dominant. So therefore we say uh the the earth, the solid part dissolves into water, the liquid part that we have. That, that's the process. And then gra gradually the liquids also get dried. Uh, and then the, the more warmth of the body becomes more obvious. And then that, that, that fire element also becomes less dominant and the wind element becomes more dominant. And then that also becomes less dominant than uh, consciousness space and then consciousness and then finally clear light like that right so th these teachings are found in tantra okay um. <laughs> can you, uh, there are so many people that already asked the questions could you do, would you like to point to any Okay. <laughs> Any, we have only three minutes. Thank you. I guess last one. Oh, uh, 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 okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think he has. <laughs> this is like really, not asked a really race. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, uh, thank you so much, uh, Geshala. It's been a wonderful few days. Um, a lot of my spiritual like sadhana has been begin from a yogic path. And I've learned somewhat about Sankhya philosophy and yoga philosophy, Advaita Vedanta. And I'm seeing a lot of parallels yes. in Buddhist teachings as well. Mm -hmm. 
like the i feel like the foundational aspects like really sit with each other mm. um and i do find that the bodhi sattva is one of the uh, like additional things that i i am going to take with me when i yeah, step yeah, out yeah, of yeah, here yeah, yeah. um i was wondering if you have any thoughts on how these two practices can be either complementary or maybe not complementary i'm not sure how that sits together but even practices like mahamudra or uh, you know the yogic anatomy which informs some of the tant i don't know what informs what but if you could shed some light if you have any insights on the integration of yogic and buddhist philosophies and the most important as i said according to buddhist teaching the most important purpose of your spiritual practice is to deal with the negative emotions and eliminate this obstructive negative emotions and cultivate all the positive qualities like bodhicitta that's the target so any of your study philosophy practice contributing to that then it's okay if it's not contributing to that then it it may be like phenomenology you know <laughs> it's like studying the tree how it is you know <laughs> stones how it is there are so many things you know so therefore shanti deva said life is short there are too many things to do and we do not know how long we are going to live therefore take only those things which you think is really really important so don't carry it away by different interpretations this looks good this looks good this looks good okay this looks good so what what is it that you want to use or useful i think that is more important that's more important yes thank you so much otherwise you know there is a debate in saying kebe shi na chian de meaning that when the scholars say something whichever scholar when they say something it looks correct right so you you need to use your thinking within the parameter that life is short you want happiness and uh, the obstructive factors are negative emotions so therefore i will concentrate on this so don't get sidetracked i think that is important yeah okay thank you